chance to introduce themselves. Yeah, hi there, Sharon. This is Keith Jablonica in the Governor's Salmon Recovery Office and Recreation Conservation Office up in Olympia. Any others who just joined us? Uh, this is Maureen Cavanaugh from BPA. Hi, Maureen. All right. Well, I usually do a few announcements. There are a few new people who have joined us, people who haven't um, been on these calls before, and we've been meeting since March, and we've uh, gotten pretty far. We had some initial questions, which were mostly uh, having to do with trying to learn what's out there for data visualization. And our questions were, um, who are the audiences? What's the data? Uh, how will we best uh, visualize our data using best practices um, and then we decided well the best thing is to figure out what's out there first and to learn lessons from each other uh, so that these are our initial uh, goals for the work group is to just learn from each other so given those goals we've been having several presentations that have been really good um, today we have John Otterburn showing us what the Colville uh, nation has been doing with habitat status and trend results for the METAL. So we have a lot of interest in John's presentation and John told me that he um, hasn't presented this before. He's really glad he's getting a chance to do this to the community. Um, but announce it. all I have for announcements, um, please let other people know that this group is, is going. Everybody's welcome and uh, I would like you to Go here to the Google Drive folder where there's a lot of uh, resources. And we're trying to build a little library of data visualization resources. <laughs> PNAMP.org also has information. It's under projects, data management, best practices. This is our project page, data visualization. And in this project page, we have many documents. We have previous presentations and our notes. So you can go back and see the previous presentations. <clears throat> Does anybody else have announcements or questions for the group? All right, then we'll get right to the presentation. Uh, John's ready to share his screen and show us what he's doing. And uh, John, if you would like to take the screen, that would be great. John is going to talk for a little bit longer. He said there are a lot of details he would like to cover. And so he's talking a little bit longer than we usually do. Um, he wants us to be able to use his tool and he wants us to, wants to show us um, many details about it. And then there's an entirely different website that we probably will have some time to get to, um, the data results at the Okanagan Monitoring website. So John, I'll turn my screen over to you. Okay, thank you, Sharon. I uh, appreciate that. And I will try not to mess this up um, and get this to work the way it's supposed to. So, you folks should very, very shortly here see my screen, which is uh, the population level report card for the Methow Basin. Um, so, can you see that, Sharon? We see it. It looks good. So now, uh, this might be a little different than some of the previous presentations, because I actually want to run you folks through a tool that we've created. We just completed this uh, tool back in April, and uh, so you're one of the first big audiences we've been able to uh, demonstrate it to. Uh, we have done some smaller demonstrations to local folks that contributed to it, and everybody's pretty excited about it right now. And we've gotten a lot of really positive feedback so far on our tool. Just to give you a little background on what we've created here, because I realize that just jumping into this thing cold with no background probably would leave a lot of people behind. Uh, but we started this effort uh, almost two years ago uh, in the Met How uh, with funding from Bonneville Power Administration. And the purpose behind our effort was to take existing data 
that had been collected since 2004 in the METHOW and to run it through the Ecosystem Diagnostic and Treatment Model or EDT model. And then with the results that the model uh, produces, create an interface that would help people be able to derive useful information from those model outputs in a very quick and efficient manner. Um, for a number of years in the Okanagan Basin, we've been working with this model and our monitoring program to create uh, a variety of ways to look at habitat in terms of benefits to fish. And we've built a variety of ways to do that uh, through paper reports in the past. And this is our first attempt to try to change from a paper reporting platform to a cloud-based uh, web accessible reporting platform. And this is really something that I think is very much gonna be the wave of the future. As we get more and more complex data sets that we need to articulate in a way that people can use them, uh, I think this cloud-based approach is gonna be really take hold and become kind of the future of how we do that. So with that said, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail on the methods of how we got from point A to point B, and I can certainly have a very lengthy sidebar conversation with anybody that's interested after the presentation about methodology. But suffice to say, we've collected data from 25 different agencies that worked in the METHOW and collected some form of habitat data. We assimilated all that empirical habitat data into categorical input variables that go into the EDT model, which are called level two attributes. And we have a bunch of documents on our Okanagan monitoring website that you can go to if you wanna look into the process by which that's done. What I wanna to talk today about is the results and the outputs. And I think most people in this group, that's primarily what their interest is as well. So this first screen that's on your screen right now, I'm gonna start talking about but first, what I want to do is run you around the interface and get you familiar with the controls just so you understand what I'm doing when I click on various things. So if you can see my cursor, I'm moving around a map of the Methow Basin. We first, the first thing we did was we broke the Methow apart from three different levels. First of all, the level is the basin as a whole or the population level. The second level is what we call assessment units, which are the HUP-12 uh, designated uh, uh, reaches of the METHOW. And we call them assessment units or diagnostic units. And then as you zoom down into the hierarchy, there's also reaches within each of these assessment units. These are uh, geomorphic reach sections that were artificially confined to a one to four kilometer length in order to assure that we didn't have any size bias problems with the modeling effort. And so the maximum length is four kilometers, minimum length is one kilometer, but to the best of our ability, these are broken along uh, hydrogeology uh, breakpoints. So I'm going to go back to the full basin view here. The important thing to consider when you're looking at the interface is that the, all of the results on the right interact with the map. So you need to understand what level you're at in the map. So there's this sub-basin view that we're looking at right now. But as I change the view, I go down to a diagnostic unit, you'll notice that things changed on the right because the data are connected to the area you are looking at on the map. If I go down to a reach scale, it changes again to another set of data. We think that this hierarchical approach to data is really, really key to understanding your basin in a meaningful way, because the things that you look at at the population scale are not necessarily the same things you want at the reach scale and vice versa. So we changed the data sets accordingly. So now I'm gonna to come to the right hand portion of the screen and I'm going to go to the very top of the screen here where it says species. 
And we have two different species that we modeled in the Met Howl. We have Spring Chinook and we have Summer Steelhead. And if you'll notice when I change the species, the information also changes on the display because the species has a great bearing on the model outputs and there's a separate model run for each species. Also, if I come over here to status and trend year, 2014 is currently displayed. And that is what we, that was the latest data we could get our hands on complete data sets for when we started the process. So that's the latest, most current year we have modeled. The 2004 version is taken from the old subbasin planning model that was run in the Methow Basin for subbasin planning. And we just moved that information over to the new interface and integrated those same data and results with the new uh, hierarchical platform uh, uh, of the reaches, because there was a different reach network used in the original subbasin planning model. The status and trend year is, is important when you're thinking about uh, what you're trying to relate data back to. And the reason why I say that is because is if you look at this trend comparison tab, there's a template or a 2004 version. We have created a template which is considered free development. Um, and what that means is, is that this is the theoretically best condition that the Methow could be restored to. This template condition was based on primarily the subbasin planning information that was gathered. And we didn't change template condition unless we had new viable data that clearly indicated that what they had had in the subbasin planning process was clearly inaccurate or wrong. In those cases where we had some meaningful data to change the template, we did so uh, because we felt like it would be remiss not to. The trend and status and trend year interact with one another within the data set. So right now, the screen that you're seeing at the population level is looking at the current data set in relationship to the template data set. And when we talk about things like VSP criteria, that, it, that shows all of the information at a glance. But in areas where the screenshot only shows one view, you need to keep in mind that the reference is from current to and compares against the template condition. If you're more interested in perhaps the status or change in the environment that occurred, then you can go back, you can change this trend comparison to 2004, and it will only tell you what the differences were between the 2004 model run and the 2014 model run. So. You can manipulate the data however you want and get access to everything we have. The other scenario you can work with is you can look at the template compared to the 2004 results, which would give you another set of information. But I'm going to reset these back to 14. And for most of this talk, I'm going to be talking about the template as the, as the baseline and we're going to be talking about changes to 2014, which will display current results from this most latest model run. So I'm going to go back to the subbasin view and this performance summary. Now you'll notice that I have a series of tabs at the top here. At the population scale, you have the choice of performance summary, VSP criteria summary, habitat trends, and obstruction performance. These are specific types of information that are available at that scale. So right now we're looking at the performance summary tab. You can tell that because it's highlighted in the dark green. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is, is that we have a variety of text on the screen that you can read, which is important for you to consider while you're looking at the results. Also, at each of these gray header boxes, we have a question mark. There are various question marks that we've placed on the interface that help you understand what the graphic is, 
how to interpret that graphic, and how it was calculated. We've tried our best to make these intuitive and not get too much down into the weeds in the jargon perspective, but to some extent, some level of jargon is just at needed to explain things. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was the results of this habitat speedometer, which is just a very gross measure of overall performance for the subbasin. So basically what we're saying here is that overall the habitat in the Methow Basin is operating at about 43% of what would be possible if we went back to template conditions, which means that you're probably, you have some places that you need to do some work in the basin basically. And realistically, you are unlikely to ever get better than probably 80 to 90% of template because to be honest, there's just things you're never going to change. There's highways and there's dam and, and irrigation infrastructure and there's cities and towns and things that are going to probably always be there and in some way constrain the habitat uh, regardless of our best efforts. Now, if I change the species to summer steelhead, you'll see that it's operating at about 70% of the template, and the steelhead habitat in the meadow is really in pretty good shape. Um, there's probably still some things we can do to make it better, but, but the, the outcome of this is, is that you should probably would be looking, if you're doing habitat restoration work, you should be probably looking at priorities under spring chinook. Spring Chinook are also endangered in the Methow, whereas Steelhead are only threatened. So there's another reason why you might want to focus your energies on Spring Chinook restoration. The other thing that I wanted to talk about a little bit is this information graphic. We've been doing uh, monitoring and EDT modeling in the Okanagan Basin for a number of years now. Uh, and we have gone through a whole series of iterations with the model. And one of the things we found in the Okanagan was that the change in the data was quite profound uh, between the first couple of iterations of the model. We had a basin that basically had little or no information available during subbasin planning, and we needed a monitoring program to help inform just plain, straight out, absolute data gaps in our basin. So it took a long time for us to get the quality of the data to the point where we could actually measure change on the landscape in a meaningful way. What we find is the first couple of iterations of the model tend to be driven more by changes in data coming in. In other words, the data gets it gets better very quickly when you first focus your energies on trying to collect data to inform the model. And those changes in the data have a tendency to drive the results more so than actual changes on the landscape. After you've had three or four iterations of the model, then all of a sudden the results change and it starts to be driven by what's actually occurring on the landscape more so than changes in the quality of the data going into it. And that's the point at which we're at in the Okanagan. Unfortunately, this is only the second iteration of the model in the Methow. And what you find is the template values are a lot better than they were in 2004. And in 2004, the data quality back then was really quite poor. Today, we have high, a much higher confidence that we have accurate data in the Methow. Uh, but honestly, until we put together a monitoring platform that is specifically designed to feed this model, we'll continue to probably change the data more quickly than the habitat is actually changing. So this is really uh, kind of a really important point that I want to I want to make to people. It's not that you can't look at the results and get value out of the results. But people just have to be cognizant that if, particularly if they're trying to look at the change in the watershed between one scenario and another scenario, uh, those may be driven more by the data than by actual landscape changes. 
The other thing I want to point out to people is this population performance summary. And this population performance summary down here actually looks at various population parameters, the modeled estimate, and observed values. And I'm going to click over here to Summer Steelhead just so you guys can see that value as well. And I'm going to talk about these numbers just a little bit in the steelhead realm. So in the steelhead realm, the habitat's doing pretty well in the Medhow. And our habitat estimate is that you can do a population abundance value of about 1,100 fish. Now, I want people to be aware that I'm going to talk in general about these numbers and not get down to it's exactly 1124 fish because this is a model estimate and it's not going to be exact it's going to be an approximation so it, i always kind of round these off to the nearest hundred and just say okay roughly 1100 fish uh, are currently able to be supported now when we talk about the edt estimate it's important to understand that these are values based on wild fish production. What's possible with wild fish? Now in the observed values over here, what we have is we have a value that's represent, represented by uh, the state of Washington data that's collected in the MedHow. These are actual empirical fish estimates collected by WDFW in the MedHow basin and we converted the data from their information to comport to our spatial structure in the basin as best we could. At the population scale, this observed value uh, is a six-year geomean estimate. So you're not talking about one year, you're talking about a six-year geomean estimate. And so the average return over the last six years uh, was almost 4,000 fish to the Methow. That's composed of 805 wild fish and about 3,000 hatchery fish. And what this tells me is, is that we're, we're getting a return to the Methow that's pretty good in terms of populating the habitat with wild fish. But that that number of returning fish could be severely constrained by the fact that you're also swamping them with three, almost 3,000 hatchery fish. The other question that's kind of interesting that pops up from this display of information is the fact that, you know, we may be setting up the, the public to have unreal ex, unrealistic expectations about the numbers of fish that the MedHow can support. The idea that we're getting 4,000 fish back a year to this basin, yet we still consider the steelhead as threatened, that's kind of a really big question there. And should we really be trying to return 4,000 fish a year to a habitat that's really only capable of supporting somewhere in the neighborhood of 11, 1,200 fish? Um, so those are really interesting questions that we're actually just as pleasant surprise of us putting all the data in one place. We knew that we wanted to show our model estimates, and we also knew we wanted to, to be transparent about what the actual empirical data shows so that people would understand in relationship to the empirical data where our model results stood. But I was really surprised at the number of conversations I have with people about this screen and about how we should possibly be doing things in the MedHow as a result of just placing this information in context so that people have it in front of their face and they can talk about it. Um, the recovery threshold for steelhead is 1,500 fish in the MedHow, and that may may or may not be a realistic number. Um, so. You know, we've got lots of discussions that can go on once you have this information in front of a group of people. And I think the stimulating those conversations and those discussions is a huge part of our job as monitoring folks is to put the data out there in front of people so that they can make more informed decisions. Uh, and we've never had a tool like this before. Uh, so I think it, I, I'm really excited about it. Now, I want to go down here to the adult trend number, and I want to just talk about this real briefly. Um, this 
EDT estimate category, what it's showing you is it's showing you the trend back to template. Remember this tab up here? If we say change this to 2004, the habitat or the estimate of habitat conditions actually went up 611 fish from the 2004 model run. But if we go back to template, which remember again, is considered the optimal conditions in the METHAL, it's actually 491 fish less than where we're at today. So uh, our today's results are 491 fish less than template. Sorry, I misspoke that. Um, on the observed value, this 301 fish in the adult trend is the increase from year one of that uh, six year geo mean, or, or take that back. The previous six year geo mean compared to this six year geo mean. So, look back to the previous six years. So, when you look at the geo mean from WDFW data, it was 301 fish less than what the current estimate is. And that's for total fish. Uh, and that's not broken apart into hatchery and wild components. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the smolt abundance because the problem with the smolt abundance information is is that we do generate a smolt abundance estimate from the model uh, and we also have a trend. But where I have a problem with that is the actual empirical data that is collected, which is collected at a rotary screw trap and is a component of both wild and hatchery fish that leave the system, whereas the EDT estimate would only be wild fish. But also I have a problem with the smolt estimates because the, the variance on these data from a smolt trap are tr provide terribly wide margins. Oftentimes rotary screw trap can be over 100% uh, off of the mean, and therefore, you know, you got to question some of those estimates as to how accurate they are and how much we could really leverage them, because uh, they're just not very precise. Um, so anyway, the, the numbers are what they are, but uh, there's a lot more variability in these values, so it's less valuable than the adult return data. So now I'm going to go quickly through just these other tabs. I'm not going to spend tons of time analyzing each one of the windows, but I do want to at least make sure that people are aware of the information that's here. We have VSP criteria values that are generated from the model. We have abundance uh, and capacity uh, values that we populate. The template value 2004, 2014. These are adults. Uh, we also have juveniles. Now, keep in mind, if you want to know more about some of the information here, we also have the question marks you can go to. Um, and the juvenile capacity abundance information is here. Um, and then we also have adult diverse uh, life history diversity. Uh, we also have adult habitat productivity. And we also have juvenile productivity. And then we also have the Beverton Holt stock recruit function for that group of fish. So this is steelhead in the map. Um, the Habitat Trends page is really important in terms of the audience here kind of shifts from fish managers. Now all of a sudden we're talking specifically to habitat practitioners and trying to provide some guidance to them. So this habitat trend page is really an important thing that, that I, I'm sure most of you are well aware that there's an effort afoot to try to come up with ways to prioritize work, particularly in locations and by limiting factors. And this tool provides a really quick, easy way to do that. So for example, if you look under the combined rank, priority rank, this goes from one to 48, and there's one that's not numbered because it's actually not a spawning reach. Um, and those numbers represent the rank relative to each other uh, uh, 
and how that number is calculated is it's based on all of the VSP criteria, productivity, abundance, capacity, and diversity. What we do is we get a mean value across all the reaches for each of those values, and those are averaged to come up with a number, and those numbers are then ranked, and that's what is shown as the priority ranking. So Wolf Creek, across all the VSP criteria, is, is a ha the highest priority habitat to work on for summer steelhead. Now, that doesn't mean that that's the only place you should work. And I've been working very, very closely with Joe Connor and Sean Welsh at BPA. And they have said that they really like this list. And they want to utilize that to uh, prioritize restoration actions. But the way they're going to look at it and use this tool is not to look at what the number one priority is. What they're going to do is they're roughly going to take this list of 48 different areas. They're going to look at the top third of those habitats, and they're going to say, those are high-priority areas we need to do work on. So if you have a restoration action in those areas, and if you're addressing the limiting factors in those areas, then we probably ought to support your project. And they're going to give it a lot less level of scrutiny than they would if you were working in the bottom group of areas where you would have to much more strongly justify a restoration action you were doing there and why you chose to do it. Not that you couldn't work in those areas, but your level of justification would be higher there than in an area that was considered a high priority area. And I think that's a really good way to look at this thing. It's not a litmus test. It's not a yes, no answer. It's a, how much, how much scrutiny do you need to give a project in this area versus this area? And it's just a level of detail that you might need to add in order to justify a project. And so that, that gives your ranking in terms of restoration. When it comes to protection projects, we also have information that will help there. When it comes to protection projects, we, we think that abundance is king. And primarily, where you ought to be protecting uh, uh, the highest priority areas is places that are currently producing a lot of fish. And so abundance is a good category to use in those terms. These red bars on this tornado diagram, the longer the bar is, the higher the priority for protection. And so you can hover over one of these bars, like Methow Altakuli here, and you can look at the display and it will tell you what the value is. And you could lose up to 93% of the population estimate that's being produced currently in that area if the habitat were degraded to zero. Um, so this is habitat that's highly functional and is a high priority for protection. And so these are not ranked because we had to choose to use either restoration or priority as the method for ranking the list, but it's pretty easy at a glance to see where the high priority protection areas are because they have these big bars as opposed to these little tiny bars which are lower priority areas. And so, and if you want to actually look at the numbers, you can actually find out exactly what the number is that it ranks out as in protection. But we had to organize the display in a way, and we thought that it was more important to rank them by restoration potential than protection. And the protection was easier to identify from the tornado diagram. The last page that I want to talk about a little bit is this obstruction performance page. The obstruction performance page is the only page on the whole schematic that is not tied to the map because it looks at all of the diagnostic areas at the same time and therefore it doesn't change the data set when you change the map look. Um, and you can look at this graphic both by Summer Steelhead and by Spring Chinook, or you can combine them together, and you can see what the results are going to be as far as the potential for 
production above the culvert if it was fixed or repaired or the passage impediment was fixed. Now, if there is no passage impediment, all of these are obstructions that currently don't have passage impediments in place on them. In that case, it doesn't show up. It just doesn't have a value. Um, one of the things that we found in the MetHow is in terms of data was that we had some real data gaps in terms of barriers in the MetHow. Uh, there is actively a project that is going on currently uh, by one of the agencies that works in the basin to assess all the barriers in the MetHow. Uh, so we believe that in the next model run that we will have vastly improved data over what currently exists. Um, but that was an identified weakness in the MetHow and why there's an ongoing project, but we didn't have that data in time to include it in the modeling for this run. So now that I've talked about all the population stuff, I'm just going to select at random a uh, diagnostic unit. And I'm going to pick this diagnostic unit, and then I'm just going to go over here to performance summary, and we can look at the various values that uh, pop up during the assessment at the assessment unit scale. So at the assessment unit scale, we still have the habitat speedometer that, in general, talks about just this area, the met how, and the con general condition the habitat is in, and that once again switches between the species. It's not. It's doing a lot less good in that reach for spring chinook than it is for summer steelhead. It also shows you, demonstrates what the current data quality is. And then also where we have the data, we broke the observed data from WDFW into data for just this assessment unit. Because there's only one rotary screw trap on the Met How, we really couldn't break apart where those fish came from. Uh, so we didn't have any way to plug in an observed value for juvenile fish. Uh, but for the adults, because they have an extensive array of pit tags and they do red surveys, we were able to pretty effectively break down the observed value for adult responders. Uh, in each of these areas. So there is a relationship between these numbers and these numbers, and you can view them for every assessment unit. Um, and then uh, the VSP calculations are exactly the same, uh, but they're just for a smaller area as at the population scale. The habitat trend data, though, changes tremendously because at the assessment unit scale, we now start bringing in limiting factors. Limiting factors change by spatial area. And so at each spatial scale, you need uh, a way to inform the limiting factors at that spatial scale. At this particular scale, what we look at is these limiting factors in terms of their performance. Uh, and so for example, in this area, the he most heavily weighted factor limiting factor is this lack of habitat diversity. It's currently operating at about 92% of the template, so it's in pretty good shape, as are all the attributes in this reach. Keep in mind, we're looking at steelhead, and the condition of the habitat was pretty good. Um, and these level of proof values represent how well we believe the data is represented in that limiting factor. So a level of proof rating that's high, like this 3.5, means we have really strong data going into these calculations, and we feel very, very certain that this is a pretty accurate representation. If we have only a one rating, it means we have very little data going into that factor, and it is probably somebody's best guess as to what it is but it's not really based on an empirical piece of data. These 2.7s are probably articulated by some data that exists in an adjacent or similar assessment unit 
but it was probably not measured specifically in this site. Uh, the other thing that we have here to look at is the composition of the habitat. We break out the habitat into these following units, and the percentage of habitat under template conditions is pictured, pictured here. The current condition based on the current observation or most recent observations from empirical data is here, and you can quickly see the differences between the two. In terms of what, how that breaks out in terms of life stages for fish and the value of that habitat, those values are down in this table below. And there's also a habitat capacity estimate that's placed at the bottom here for reference. Now, I'm going to go to a reach within this. If you go to the obstruction performance, before I do that, you'll notice that the graph didn't change. It's exactly the same graph as before because when we change spatial reference, it doesn't change this graphic. But when we, on our habitat uh, tab, if you go down to a specific reach, now in this particular instance, we're talking about reach M5A, and sorry that we don't have cute names for all these things, but we were trying to number 200 some reaches and it just seemed more practical to do a, a alphanumeric numbering system. Numbering system. Um, but this particular reach, uh, you can go to this consumer reports diagram and if people have used EDT in the past, they'll be very, very familiar with these outputs. This was the one holdover from the from the kind of historic EDT model that we really haven't changed a whole lot. Um, there is some additional data that we've placed on this <laughs> and it really does, in my mind, help you understand uh, these report outputs. In the past, people used to just look for the biggest red dot as what I should do. Uh, but we've added a bunch of data that would help you maybe come up with a different answer. First of all, we rank life history stages, and right here, this number one means this is the highest priority life history stage in this reach, and that'll vary depending on the reach you're in, but age two migrants are having some issues in here in terms of habitat diversity. Now, an age two migrant, is probably going to be looking for some hiding cover uh, along the margins of the stream as it's moving out of the system. And so those might be the type of habitats you want to look at restoring here. It also represents 20% of the trajectories. Well, one of the reasons why it represents such a high proportion of the trajectories in the model is because every fish that comes from a reach above this is going to have to travel through there, and there's large production areas in the Chihuahua and the upper Methow that all have to move through this area when they migrate. So migration uh, habitat is going to be really a critical element in this reach because every fish, most of the fish in the basin are gonna have to move through that habitat type. So I'm gonna go back here, try to make sure I get to the right one problem with doing it random because sometimes I forget where I'm at. Um, the other thing that I really find very, very useful are the survival factor weighting percentages down here at the bottom. Instead of just looking at the consumer reports diagram and trying to find the biggest dot, instead what I like to look at is if you look across all life history stages, this 73% of the time, you're going to run into some issue with habitat diversity being a problem for them. <laughs> so improving habitat diversity across the board is going to benefit all life stages. And so th those percentage values really, really, to me, highlight specific things that you should work on, as well as the number of trajectory percentages. That's a really valuable thing to look at as well as well as our life stage ranking. All of those are really critical pieces of information and can direct you to different results. So 
The Consumer Reports diagram is still here, and it can show you what that particular loss is. But oftentimes on these Consumer Report diagrams, there's lots of things that are similar, of similar value. And these percentages help you break apart them in a more meaningful way in terms of trying to inform what you might do from a restoration perspective. Um, and again, down below here, we have these level of proof values, which go back to the raw data and say, this is really poor data on this limiting factor versus really good data on this limiting factor. And you should also always weigh in the level of uh, information that you have before making a final decision on how to move forward. Also down below at the reach scale, we continue to look at the habitat typing and the life stage composition of the habitat and the trend. Unfortunately, right now, we only have a couple of trend pieces in here, so this isn't as valuable as it would be if you had three or four different model runs to look at. So. I am going to back out here. Oh, hold on. I want to go one more, to one more thing real quick before I go back and open this up to some questions. Um, I'm going to go back to this reach. I want to make one, one more plea. Well, two more pleas, real quick. So, one thing I want to, I want to point out to people is that. In the reach level, if you go to the performance summary, you'll notice this page changes from the different spatial scales. You have priority ranking of that reach amongst that the other reaches within that assessment unit. You also show the assessment unit, which was the fourth rated assessment unit out of 14, and, and it was ranked 14 in, as far as preservation priority, um, the, and that was out of 49. And then the reach itself is the third rated restoration priority within that assessment unit out of 10 different reaches that are contained within that assessment unit. It also happens to rank out as the third priority for preservation. So there's some good stuff here already to protect, but there's also some stuff to, to change. Um, but what I really found most valuable in this page really kind of was another surprise for me just because the data came out this way. Lots of people uh, had talked to me at various times when I've given presentations in the past about doing the EDT model, and they say, well, if I have a project, can I run the EDT model to tell me what the benefits of my project will be in terms of fish? And I've always said, yes, you can do that, but it'll cost you because it's not cheap or easy to run the EDT model, and it puts a lot of emphasis on the person doing the project to understand the EDT model so they know which levers to pull and how much. That, that takes a fair amount of time and energy and money to do. But what we ended up with at the bottom of this thing was a really neat back of the envelope way to calculate benefits to doing restoration work. So if you'll follow with me, one of the things that I've told people to do is, is that in this assessment unit, if you address these limiting factors, and if 73% of the weighting is on this one habitat diversity thing, so you could take that 73%, if you improved all the things you thought you could do to restore habitat diversity in that reach, and you couple that with the information on this performance summary, you could see how many of the seven fish, uh, uh, excuse me, take it back. The seven fish represents the current condition. The change in that is the trend, which is down 31%. So what you have left to restore is that 33% of seven fish. Now, a third of seven fish is roughly two, two fish, I'll say. You'll be able to benefit by two fish, the summer steelhead, in that particular reach. Now, keep in mind, there's 200 of these reaches. So the fish numbers may sound small, but there's lots of reaches. So you're getting down to a pretty small spatial structure. But if you did a two fish increase across 200 reaches, that's going to benefit the population by 400 fish. So people need to understand the context between space and these values. 
But these values give you a way to do a quick and dirty calculation about what restoration actions might actually get you tangibly in terms of actual fish production. Now, these are adult values. We don't have these for juveniles, uh, but that might be something we could do in a future iteration, and then the numbers would be bigger. Um, but it at least gives you a way to do a rough calculation of the likely value of that particular restoration activity at that particular location. And so the last thing I'm going to do, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this page, but I do want to say there's a ton of information here. This page represents the actual data that went into the EDT model. Now, all of these are based on the level two attribute rating, which goes to a, is a categorical input value from zero to four. But you can back calculate from these values what the actual empirical data is. And you can look and see what the actual value is here. And if there was a change from the last time we ran the model, and in this particular attribute alkalinity, it improved just very, very slightly. Um, you also see the value, the level two, or the, the level of proof value, which is a two in this instance. So it's of medium quality. This data is relatively poor. Uh, and, but it changed dramatically based on the information that we had. So people's opinions clearly changed. Um, I'm trying to find a higher level proof on here. Oh, okay, here we go. So the fine sediment data, we have a level proof four, which is as good as it gets. So we obviously we had empirical data on fine sediments in here. And it was actually an unchanged value from the subbasin planning days. So even though the data quality was much increased, we didn't end up changing this value from subbasin planning. So that's remained unchanged. Uh, and that value seems to be holding very steady over the years. So there's all kinds of input attributes. All of the input attributes uh, that are static and not shaped are in this first area. These attributes go into the EDT model as shaped patterns across time. And those patterns are displayed here, and they show you both the template values as well as the 2014 because those are the attributes we're looking at. But every piece of data that went in is represented. It's all transparent. Um, we've done our best to show the data that went in and the results that came out of our modeling effort. And we think this is a real valuable tool. So anyway, I'll open up to potential questions if people have questions about the interface. I have a question, John. This is Denise at CritFit. When you're at the unit level and you're looking at habitat trend, I, you only displayed five limiting factors. How did those come about? as the ones you displayed, and can we see the other limiting factors? Good question. Uh, and I'll move to the page just so everybody else, hopefully, will uh, be able to keep up with us. She's talking about these limiting factor indicators, and, and only five of them show up. But you're absolutely right, Denise. There is a whole number of limiting factors that we can come up with. I think there's 12 or 14 of them that are possible outcomes from the EDT model. And we do have that data, but we felt like every time we got to the fifth element here, the weighting values were so small that they really weren't that meaningful anymore. And they weren't driving what we should be addressing in terms of restoration action. So you can see in this example, this one's weighted as 64% of the issue is habitat diversity. And by the time you get to the second one, we're already down to only 10% of that weighting. Gotcha. Uh, so, you know, right here, if you're not dealing with these highest priority limiting factors, you're probably, your project's probably not going to do a lot of good for fish. So, yes, we could display all of the data, but we tried to keep this kind of simple and easy to, to work through. 
we kind of artificially define this as five looking at the data because we rarely saw that you had a high priority limiting factor that went beyond the fifth one. And in most cases, it was one or two that you really needed to pay attention to. So we felt like displaying five was plenty and that you wouldn't get a lot of value out of seeing the rest of them. The data does exist in our model. We just don't show it on the platform. That makes sense. Thank you. Anybody else? Hey, John, this is Keith in Olympia, and I just wanted to commend you on this very detailed and comprehensive presentation and what you've been doing for the Metal as the report card for habitat status and trends. A um, lot of information. I'm curious how how long this product has been, uh, what kind of time and resources you've invested in this to get to this point? Uh, well, it's been, it's been a considerable amount of time. We probably started trying to make this a reality almost two years ago, but in reality, the work itself took about 18 months or about a year and a half from the day we got the contract signed. Um, in addition to that, uh, it, the cost on this was probably about $365,000. Now, that's a big chunk of money. Uh, and just so people understand, this ended up being financed through my project in the Okanagan because the Colville tribes also have an interest in the Methow. But we had some carryover dollars in our MOA that allowed us some savings over at our 10-year MOA, and we were able to apply those, Bonneville allowed us to apply those to this modeling effort. So through being frugal through my monitoring program, we were able to fund the effort here. Now, I don't want to scare people off because we were carrying a lot of freight on this thing. Uh, we created this interface, this cloud interface, completely out of those dollars. So money wasn't just running the model. A big chunk of that money was developing the interface as well. And the reason why we felt like it was worth the investment was because we could see us reusing this interface over and over, and it would also benefit the Okanagan. We are currently doing the next model run in the Okanagan, and we will have the benefit of five different trend years to work with that we can mix and match on the interface in the Okanagan. But our results will look exactly the same as the Methow when we run the next Okanagan model run. And ironically, our cost to run the EDT model and put them out in this platform actually reduced our cost of modeling from 99,000 a year every time we ran the model to $40,000 a year to run the model with this interface. So there's, there's cost savings coming back by the development of the tool. We're also in the process of trying to get uh, model development funded in the Wenatchee through the surfboard process and through some of the mid-Columbia funding processes. I, I appreciate that information. So we've got uh, ongoing economies of scale. The more you could utilize the model and you could bring other sub-basins into this evidently, and you've got a lot of the R&D done with developing the interface with the cloud. Um, uh, on this current screen in the upper left corner, ICF, is that that's your contractor, correct? Uh, yes, our current contractor is ICF. Uh, they actually subbed out the interface development to a small startup company that did a great job with it. Um, but now that that's developed, we won't have to go back and redo it unless we wanted to change something. Uh -huh. is, was this, uh, is this proprietary? Um, it is not, not, not proprietary because we built the interface with BPA funds. And those are publicly accessible okay. funds, okay. and so anybody can leverage the interface. With ICF, the model is available and can be utilized by people if they have the, the ability to do it. But it's computer intensive, and it's uh, intellectually intensive to run the model itself and get all the parameters put in correctly. 
And we choose to use ICF to help us with that process. But the, the model is available for people to use if they want to, but the expertise is what you pay the contractor for. Sure, sure. And w when does that contract end with ICF and you? Oh, uh, right now we have a current contract to run the model with uh, on the Okanagan. Yeah. And uh, so after next year, I don't really have additional work for them necessarily. Um, I'm hoping this Wenatchee project gets funded, so we'll we'll move from the Okanagan model run to a Wenatchee model run shortly after that. Keep everybody working, but uh, I haven't got funding for the Wenatchee part yet. So if you have an interest, let me know. Um, well, I. I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I am interested in this. And I had a call earlier today with Greer Meyer from uh, Upper Columbia on some particulars. Um, and I'd like to talk about this offline with you at, at some later date. But thank you again for this great presentation. And it's uh, very um, compelling. Oh, sounds great. I, I'm available to meet with you anytime, Keith. Thank you, sir. Anybody else on the phone with any questions or comments for John? Yeah, this is Tom Iverson. Hi, Tom. Hi. So, John, you said you're going to run the model next year for in the Okanagan, and then you don't see a need for ICF after that. How often do you anticipate running the model, uh, and can you run the model in-house after next year? Uh, well, that's also a great question. We have we have the model in house now. Feeling comfortable with our internal expertise on running the model, I'm not so sure I'm there yet. Um, but we feel like most of the development work is done. Uh, so right now, our current operating process with BPA and in the Okanagan is to run it every four years. We collect data across the entire basin over a four-year period, and then at the end of that period, we have a new set of data that we then run the model on, and we update all the information every four years. Recently, I've been trying to figure out very cost-effective ways to expand our habitat program over to the METHOW, and I think you can change that temporal period to a longer time frame. Honestly, habitat doesn't change dramatically in a really short order. I think eight years is a fine period of time in order to still detect change on the landscape. And the longer you wait, the more the change is likely to drive the results. So we've been toying with the idea of possibly bringing on the MedHow and doing a system where we work in the MedHow for four years, collect data there, run the model at the end of that four year in the METHOW, then move back to the Okanagan, collect data for a four year period, run the model in the, in the Okanagan. In which case we would need ICF to come in and help us run the model two out of those eight years. Um, or, and so I'm trying to relate back to your question. It all depends on your, your, your monitoring scheme and how often the data are updated as to how frequently you might want to update the model. So uh, in that scenario, do you think running the model every eight years is often enough to guide on the ground restoration actions? I do, uh, because unless you really are changing things on the landscape, I don't think you're going to see a big enough change to where you're going to meaningfully change the results in less than an eight-year period. We just don't put enough stuff on the ground. So I've got another question. Um, so sure. looking at this, it looks like hugely data intensive. You're down to the reach scale with – I guess a couple hundred reaches maybe a hundred reaches uh, how much I mean how much monitoring would it take to feed this this template to feed this model and how much of it is real data and how much is it is expert opinion which is always a criticism of you 
Yeah, sure. Uh, well, you know, everything's dependent on resources that you have available. Ideally, in a perfect world, if you had unlimited resources, I would love to have a habitat crew measure every one of the 42 attributes in EDT in all 200 reaches. But that's not very realistic. We're not going to be able to put a USGS gauging site in every reach of the basin. So there's always going to be trade-offs with the amount of resources you have available to your monitoring program and how detailed you can be with the information. The setup that we put together for the EDT model would allow you to do that if you had unlimited resources. But what we find is more often than not, there are great economies of scale. And so oftentimes, a single USGS gauge placed in the right location in a basin can give you good detailed information about how flow changes across time and the magnitude of those changes for a whole group of reaches, and you don't necessarily need a second gauge. Um, likewise, you can put temperature loggers around in one or two of the reaches but it's unlikely that that value is going to change significantly from one reach to another. So you don't need to place a data logger in every reach. You can apply the data set collected at one site to another group of reaches. We have a data gaps analysis that is part of the work we did in the MetHow. And I'll, I'll make sure that Sharon has the link to that. Um, but what you'll find in that data gaps analysis is, is that the priorities aren't to do everything every place. There are high priority items that you really got to have to run the model and to make sure that you have confidence in your results. And there's other data that's not nearly as important to run the model. For example, oxygen data doesn't really vary much and rarely varies outside of the parameters that would cause you to have a fish survival change or an EDT attribute change. So collecting uh, a whole bunch of empirical uh, dissolved oxygen data, unless you have some sort of point source pollution that's coming into your system, probably is unwarranted. Um, and as a matter of fact, in the Okanagan, that's one of the attributes that we don't collect any data on because we haven't found that it's useful in the model. So for every basin, there's going to be a different suite of data that's absolutely necessary to collect. Uh, and depending on the, re the resources available, you may get higher or lower quality data that still fits the bill. As long as it, you come up with the same categorical variable that goes into the EDT model, it doesn't have to be the absolute number of the value for that attribute. As long as you're within the range and you don't change the model input, that's good enough. So there's lots of discussions we can have around how do you do this and how do you monitor properly for this, but it is very flexible. The platform is flexible. It can take everything from the best data in the world to, to somebody's opinion, and it can still generate results. What we want to do is figure out exactly what we need in the suite of data and that's why we always couple these large-scale efforts like we did in the MetHow where we look at a composite of data across the basin and we generate a data gaps analysis as part of that so you can properly structure an appropriately sized monitoring program that specifically addresses the needs of the model and that's an efficient way to put monitoring dollars on the ground. Thanks, John. Right. Thank you, John. This is a really great presentation. A lot of work into it, a lot of data. Uh, I really appreciate the presentation. Um, and it is a starting point for a lot of discussions we can start having. I like how you say that the data visualization uh, illustrated some surprises that you didn't expect, um, especially comparing your table, say the belt abundances with your estimate versus observed. <laughs> and um, yeah, I have questions about the variables that you use. I'm curious, I may see that you weight them. I don't know in your modeling if you used interactions to show, say, additive effects, multiplicative effects. Um, 
but certainly the modeling can show how you could use down the road fewer variables that might be important. Um, yeah, so any more questions? We're getting toward the end. We have another 15 minutes we can spend. Any more questions for John? And John, if you wanted to show us anything about the Okanagan monitoring, we can do that briefly. I can certainly do that, and I also have a, question, uh, a list of questions that you provided that we can go to if we need filler after that. Um, so hopefully everybody can see this Okanagan Basin monitoring uh, graphic on the screen. Yeah, we do. Um, okay, so uh, this is our Okanagan Basin monitoring website, and I didn't show you the home page because it's just a pretty picture and it, it just allows you to navigate to a different portion of the website. We do require that you sign in when you first come here and create a password. Uh, not that we are trying to hide it from anybody, but it just helps us uh, with tracking people coming and going just in case something nefarious were to happen. Uh, it's a recommendation that was made by the people that host our website. So uh, that's unfortunately a drawback. We would like to make it more available, but we really don't think signing up for a password is that big a deal. Um, and what I'm showing here on this graphic here, I'm actually going to change what I'm showing here and show the entire population. Um, this is our adult abundance data for the Okanagan. Now, in the Okanagan, we have been running the Okanagan Basin Monitoring and Evaluation Project since 2005. It actually started in 2004, but we really started collecting data in 2005. And the data in this uh, graphic shows an illustration of the data that has been collected across the Okanagan Basin on adult steelhead. Um, and the dots here represent the actual empirical data that was collected that year, and it shows the actual number of fish that's represented by that dot. The black line represents the linear trend line that would lay if you use those dots and shows an increasing trend over time. And you can also figure out what your intrinsic growth rate is by looking at the slope of the line, which is almost 14 fish increase per year from since 2005 to 2017. So there's some really nice data you can use, get from that. In addition, we also have the delisting goal, which for the Okanagan population, which includes Canada, is 1,000 fish. And so you know where you're at in reference to the delisting goal. We also have a set of Colville Tribe recovery goals for steelhead in the Okanagan Basin. And the Colville Tribe's recovery goal, which means restored back to full health, full harvestable health, uh, would be about 1,775 fish. So we have a lot further to go to reach that target. We felt like it was important to give everybody reference places on these graphics to show how close or far away you were to the established targets. Now, we selected early on in this program to break our basin apart into the smaller subunits, just like we did for the habitat work, because we felt like fish recovery doesn't occur one population at a time. It occurs one fish at a time, and each fish can only occupy a relatively small amount of space at any one time. So breaking apart fish into smaller units only seemed to make sense as a logical way to manage them and try to recover them. So in the Okanagan Basin, what you'll see is that we have a whole big drop-down list of different reaches that you can break out our fish into. And each area has a different number of fish associated with it. It also has a different trend. Now, the lower similcamine, if you look at the graphic there, which is one of our major tributaries, the trend line is actually going down in terms of wild fish production. Um, and that's not necessarily a good thing, even though the population as a whole is improving. And part of the reason for that is, is in the Okanagan River Basin, we have a lot of high temperature issues in our main stem reaches. 
And really where restoration occurs and where the recovery of steelhead is doing best is in our tributary streams. So if we go to some of our tributary streams, which you can get a collection of graphs there, Loop Loop Creek happens to be one of our restored streams that is doing much better. And you can see the trend line on it is definitely positive. And there's an increase of about two fish a year in Loop Loop Creek since 2006, which we actually didn't start collecting data there until 2006. And you'll notice that we had a whole bunch of zero years in the beginning years of this data set. The, on Loop Loop Creek, we had a number of, we had physical barriers and we also had flow barriers in the stream that needed to be rectified. And since restoring the, the flow and the barriers in 2010, or late 2009, uh, before the spring spawners in 2010 arrived, um, we noticed that in 2010, you have a big jump. And in almost all years since then, you also had a big jump uh, in the numbers of fish returning. And they vary. And you'll find that most streams do have varying numbers returning over time. And that's why I like, I love these trend lines and to look at the trend lines because that can kind of smooth out the information for you. But we are actually over, the trend line is above the recovery threshold that we've established for this particular stream, which was pretty simple process. What we did was we looked at the number of fish we needed for recovery and we broke out what we felt like was the percentage of habitat represented by that stream, uh, looking at uh, intrinsic potential analyses and looking at the EDT outputs. And what we said is this stream ought to produce X number of fish based on the various inputs of information that we have. And so we said, okay, this ought to carry this percentage of the weight for recovery. Then we took that percentage and multiplied that by the, the number of fish we needed for recovery so that we could come up with this goal, delisting goal for that particular habitat. So we've created these goals, and we also did that for our CCT recovery effort, which we haven't quite met that goal, but we're getting, you know, in some years we're getting pretty close. Um, but the, re the res restoration action in this particular tributary is vastly that's a vastly better story than you can tell on our main stem components. And there's other tributaries that also tell varying different stories depending on what the story is at that location. And we can pick any one of these streams and we can tell the story behind what's going on there. And so for example, on OMAC Creek, this happens to be the OMAC Creek total, we also have OMAC Creek lower and upper based on information that was generated above and below the falls, but uh, I won't show you those because those are still in, in process. Um, but anyway, the OMAC Creek total numbers are uh, include habitat above Mission Falls. Mission Falls is a, uh, a natural falls that was, had, had problems with passage uh, that were exacerbated by a narrow gauge railroad that was blasted through the bedrock falls. And we had traditional ecological uh, knowledge from the tribe that they have had harvested steelhead above the falls historically. So we knew they were passable to some degree. We didn't know the percent passage historically, but we knew they were passable. So our habitat restoration folks have worked diligently to remove the, the extra rock burden that was placed in the falls that blocked fish. And we have started to get some limited passage above the falls in some years under the right flow conditions. And right now, we're just starting to colonize that new habitat above the falls. But just with the lower section of OMAC Creek, we've almost reached our recovery target in that stream as well. And we feel pretty confident that once we open up that upper part of the basin, which is the majority of the habitat, that we will strongly surpass our recovery target for OMAC Creek total. 
Um, so like I say, every stream has its unique story. And the fish data can tie into those stories as long as the scale is appropriate for that. I've been trying to work diligently with my other fish managers to break their basins apart like this. Like I said, WDFW provided us their data in the MetHow. They don't represent their data like this, but they're collecting data in a way that it's a relatively easy job to parse out the data because I know where the data is being collected and they GPS each red that they locate. I can then pull the data apart and place them into the appropriate subunit of habitat and I can calculate things like this really simply with no additional data collection as long as people are GPSing the location of their REDs. The problem is most, most of the agencies only report a simple population value, but there's so much to be gained by the smaller increment of information, especially when it comes to doing restoration work and telling the stories about the fish communities that I really think as a region, we should be doing this uh, everywhere, in my opinion. So there are a variety of these graphics. We've done the best we can to try to make them interact uh, with the user. So you, it's quick and it's easy for the person to go check out a various stream they might have interest in. Um, even We even have data up in Canada on things like Eugene Creek. Um, and uh, so we have all kinds of data from all kinds of places. Uh, we do our best to update it. You'll notice we're only through 2017. We have collected 2018, but it's not done being processed yet. As soon as it's done being processed, it'll be updated. And we usually are less than a year behind on our website with that data. Um, there's a number of other data that you can get here. There's stream temperature data that you can go to. Now this gets really down into true data for those people that love all the details. Um, but for every location where we have collected data, you can link to the specific habitat data if you want. And anybody can upload this data from any location. So if you're another agency, if you're another tribe, if you're BPA, it doesn't matter who you are, you can download our data and we'll make it available to you. Not every piece of data that we collect is available here. There are still are elements of our data that we ask you to just make the request to us, but we always make our data as available to people as we possibly can. Um, Where's John? We're getting really yep. close to 11.30, and uh, I'd like to stop you there, and maybe we can pick this back up at the next meeting. I will send the screen back to you. Oops, I think I hit the wrong button again. Okay, it should be back to you again. Okay, thank you. Don't want to run over. I'm glad you stopped me. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a lot going on there. There's a lot we can keep discussing, and, and we'd like to, I'm sure. <laughs> it's been really great. Um, I think I'm just going to skip through uh, the rest of our agenda and actually not talk about any of that. We can handle that with email, certainly. And um, if anybody has any other comments, uh, questions, I'd like to hear them really quick. We've got about a minute and a half. No more comments? That's great. Um, let's talk about next meeting. Everybody wanted the standing meeting, and every third Thursday was uh, what we decided to do. We may have to change that in September because CNAMP is having their strategic workshop the third Thursday in September. So I may be changing that to either the second or fourth Thursday, or we may cancel September. Um, the fall is a pretty busy time, and I just wanted to give everybody a little heads up about that. Um, again, Please communicate with me if you have any ideas for other people that you'd like to see present. I'm working right now with Jordan Reed, who is a USGS person. Um, he works in the water monitoring uh, 
section in hydrology, and he has a good presentation about data visualization and what you can do with data visualization on the fly. This was great, John. This is something we could revisit and come back to. Uh, I, if you want, we can add extra time in a different meeting for people to strictly have questions, maybe questions and answers after they get a chance to play uh, with the Meta report card. Um, I know I have more questions about what's coming down the pipe. So if no one has any more, I'll give everybody a chance. Any more questions or thoughts? All right, then we'll wrap it up for today. And a big thank you to John. Nice work. And a big thank you to everybody on the line. And we'll yeah, nice work, time. John. Thank you much. Thank, and thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, John. Thank you, Brad and Sharon.